welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Breber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today we are joined again by friend of the show, Tyler, who you guys may know as Hoop Venue on YouTube. Tyler, good to have you here today, man. How we doing? Man, I'm glad to be back. I'm excited, man. This was uh, playoff season, man. Great stuff. I know, dude. Great stuff. I know. It's that time of the year. Last time we had you on, we got into a lot of all-time stuff, which was super fun. But today, we are going to be very focused on the here and the now because it is that most important time of the year. And one man who is just making himself a talking point through sheer will is Jalen Brunson. Long time favorite of ours here at Nerd Sesh, but the man is just playing at an unconscious level, carrying the Knicks, of course, without Randall, now officially done for the year with that season-ending shoulder surgery. Over his last 14 games, Jalen Brunson is averaging 34.8 points per game and 7.4 assists per game. So Tyler, with him playing at this level and just considering what he's shown us throughout this season and last year's playoff run, how many guards would you take over Jalen Brunson? Man, that's tough because, like you said, the scoring and assists have just been on another level right now. Like, in just terms of volume creation, yeah. I think... I think he's touching the ball almost 100 times a game right now um, with the loss of Randall. But the thing that really stands out to me is, like, he won't even get two turnovers in these games. And it's mm -hmm. like the ability to manage a game like that is so special because most of these high-volume ball handlers are going to make errors. They're going to – I mean, they're going to try hard passes and things like that. That's not really Brunson's style. But, like, the fact that he can touch the ball as much as a guy like Trey Young, Luka, prime James Harden – and come away with like a, t a a turnover average of like one and a half. I feel like people miss the value with that because there's no errors. Like the Knicks don't have to make a bunch of shots if one guy has the ball all game and there's no turnovers. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, it's tough. I feel like at this point, obviously, I want to wait to see what happens in the playoffs and whether the whether the Knicks can make a run. But like for me as an overall player, it's hard to pick 15 guys over Brunson at this point like yeah. I, I think some of the defensive limitations probably hold him back in some regard but like the fact that he's leaning more into the pull-up three-point shooting this year and he's shooting 46 percent from three off the catch um he can get to the rim he's the second highest volume mid-range scorer in the league gets to the line like this guy is just absolutely surgical and it's like I don't know how many players in the league you can say put the ball in this guy's hands regardless of how many injuries and they're going to produce like a 124 offensive rating it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous it is ridiculous man uh if i had to put an exact number on it and uh point out the exact guys that i would take luca steph probably sga and then are we counting two guards are we counting two guards yeah guards and i think you can wipe the probably away from sga i'd, I'd take sga <laughs> D book, but that that's the thing that like that, that Tyler's emphasizing here is like I, I even considered Jalen Brunson for my top ten like players list above a guy like Jason Tatum. And that's not a shot at all at Jason Tatum and what he does, but that's just how special Jalen Brunson is as an offensive player. Like he's the thing that really impresses me about Brunson, man, is just like how consistently he can get downhill for being such a small guard. Like literally just the ball touching the paint is such a valuable thing in the game and he makes it look so easy he's so freaking quick too and what i like tyler you talk about like he doesn't try these like luka level passes these like lebron or Jokic level passes but it's because he opens up things that are easier you know what i mean like when he gets down in the paint and he'll do a post up for a few seconds and he'll command you know three defenders to look his way it just opens a backdoor opportunity for a divincenzo and ananobi like and now you're coupling that with what was already, you know, an elite scorer. Uh, I read out this stat, I think, two shows ago. Jalen Brunson this year, 28 points per game, six and a half assists per game on 48% from the field, 40% from deep, 84% uh, from the line. The only players to average 27 points per game on 47% from the field and 40% from deep, I think Brunson's actually 39.9 exactly, so he's excluded from this, but <laughs> still the list. Larry Bird, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Michael Jordan, and then Zach Levine and Dale Ellis. So they kind of hurt the stat a little bit. But, you know, that's good <laughs> no, company no, no. to have. Hey, don't disrespect Dale <laughs> Ellis, man. Bucket. Absolute bucket. But that's the rare company that he's in with. And I also read this number out, too. 
the Knicks are 15 points per 100 possessions better with Brunson on the floor. That's the difference between the number one offense in the league and the second worst offense in the league. Uh, Jalen Brunson is a superstar. I am so comfortable with him as my number one in the playoffs. And like you guys both said, I mean, with this recent stretch without Julius Randle, I, I, again, I think the Knicks are better with Julius Randle. But I really think Brunson is still capable, if he continues playing at this late, uh, level, of getting him through not only a first-round series, maybe a second-round series too, dude. The Knicks are really well-built around him, and he is a bona fide number one offensive engine, man. There's, Like I said, there's only four guys I'd take over Brunson, man, and that's, uh, that's really special, dude. He's one of my favorite players to watch and also just one of the most effective in all of basketball right now. I agree with you, Logan. Those are the four guards to me. It's Luca, SGA, Steph, Book, and we can get into some of the specific conversations in a little bit if it's him versus Donovan Mitchell or Kyrie or whoever else people might put in that same tier. But what he's doing is historically rare right now. You already recited the rare company that he's in. I have some different numbers that are equally impressive and unfortunately don't include Dale Ellis. But if you're just looking at this 14 game span in which he's been going absolutely nuclear as we talked about the entire list of players throughout nba history to hit 34 points and seven assists per game over a 14 game stretch is brunson right now luca dame harden russ d wade ai t mac mj rick barry tiny archibald oscar robertson like this is a legitimate sample size. Of course, it's not a full season, but to do this for even 20% of a season is something that only some of the most prolific offensive engines in the history of the sport have done. And this is a guy who, lest we forget, two years ago, the Mavs wouldn't give four years 48 million to. Like, it really is one of the more incredible stories in the league, alongside the fact that Brunson is just so damn good. But I'm incredibly high on him for a few reasons. First of all, I think he is very playoff proven in that one run because what we saw is how valuable his skill set is. Like you said, Tyler, he's leaning into the pull-up threes at a higher volume. He has been absolutely deadly from beyond the arc. But we also know because of how he controls the game so expertly, because of how constantly he is in control, navigating pick and roll, and is capable of getting to his spots in and around the paint, and then is so unbelievably crafty there with the change in pace, with really next level ball handling, just with his diversity as a shot maker, right? Turnarounds, his floater efficiency is absurd. He's 54% on floaters on crazy volume. The ability to use a step through to get himself open. He just has so many different ways to dominate that intermediate and painted area that there's a floor there there's a consistency there and we can talk about shot diet and there are certainly guys who create easier shots because at the end of the day this guy is listed at 6'2 i think he's a little shorter than that guard who's not a high-end athlete in the scope of the league like basically every other star in basketball is going to have more physical advantages than him but when you are so unbelievably skilled and you are so ridiculously good as a pure shot maker it almost doesn't matter what your shot diet is because he's just that consistently great at making these shots. And of course, when we're talking about what a Luka can do with unbelievable shot making and physical advantages, that's a different tier. But when we're talking about the second tier star level players, some of the other guards who people would bring up, I love the consistency that you do get from Brunson. And what he's doing right now feels to me a bit Iverson-esque just in terms of the sheer burden of on a small guard the volume also the minutes like he's playing 40 plus minutes pretty consistently in these regular season games down the stretch and of course the 2024 knicks are way more skilled offensively than the early 2006ers but they are still lacking a second legitimate creator and so brunson does have that burden of 100 touches a game of basically every possession hey jalen can you go get us a good shot like <laughs> over the last two games he has 39 points just out of pick and roll absolutely torched the bucks there just killing dame at the point of attack killing brook in that drop coverage with the intermediate shot making so I am continually amazed by him. And he's always going to have some involvement off ball. Like, that's what I do appreciate about Brunson. He is this very pick and roll heavy on ball creator at this stage. But he still has those instincts to relocate to move to open space. Whereas we've seen some of these ball dominant players just like neglect that aspect of the game. So I agree, Logan. Like, the Knicks are an uncomfortable draw. Because with OG out there, they are going to defend at a super high level. And... Unlike last year, when quite literally 
everything was just resting on Brunson's shoulders because Randall sucked and none of their spot-up shooters could knock down an open look, so there was nobody holding teams accountable for loading up on Brunson drives. They're actually a really good spot-up shooting team now this year, even if they don't have that second creator. So I like that formula, not for a deep run, but if they draw the Pacers, like there's no question that I would pick them to win that series. For sure. I, I love how you brought up the Brunson off-ball point because... I think a lot of people see a guy getting 100 touches a game or like running a heliocentric style of offense and they think, oh, he can't play off ball. But that's mm -hmm. it's a necessity thing. Like I just made a Brunson video probably I think a week ago. And one of the most interesting stats I found was that he's averaging 1.4 points per possession as a spot up on like Ridiculous. decent volume, which it, I think it was the 99th percentile. And it's like, that's not just the 46% on catch and shoot threes. That's the catch and decisive attacking. That's mm -hmm. I, he, he's just phenomenal. Um, I, I like also the fact that he's putting up these big numbers. We also got to account for the fact that Knicks have the number 30 offensive pace. They're dead last in offensive pace. So mm -hmm. for him to be putting up those type of numbers with such a slow offense is ridiculous. Like I, I was looking the other day, he's fifth. He's the, he's one of only five players, uh, averaging 30 points per 75 on the season. And the other four are Embiid, Luka, Giannis, Shea. So mm -hmm. it's like, this guy's in good company. Um, For me, the tough thing with Brunson is, I think we actually talked about this exact discussion last time I was on the show, mm -hmm. is the floor versus the ceiling. When you compare him to a Donovan Mitchell, I think Donovan Mitchell's ceiling as a playoff creator is just absurd because although Brunson has like leaned into the pull-up shooting more, it's still not like Mitchell 11, 12 threes a game. Right. Um, or like, I also don't think he's as explosive of a slasher as Mitchell. Mitchell probably sure. makes more advanced passes more consistently. Um, so I think that's tough. But then, like you said, like last year we saw it, chips were down defenses were locked in and Brunson was just getting buckets like one-on-one -on -one, mid range, like just giving his team such a consistent floor that they could lean into defense and still win. So I think Brunson and Mitchell is a tough one for me Um, after those four we mentioned. And then the next group of guards, I think Brunson like heads a tier. Like I don't really know what to make of Dame right now, but I feel like Brunson's definitely had a better season than, Br than Dame. Yeah. Um, You got Kyrie, Anthony Edwards, Halliburton, I, I, again, I think you could make the argument for some of these guys, but I definitely think Brunson's put together a more complete season. Um, the others would be what Trey young. I, I think you're starting to stretch it there because a, as good as Trey is the, another thing with Brunson that really separates him from Trey is the physicality, man. Trey mm -hmm. will get bumped like the, the, the heat, uh, in 2022, we're just like mauling this guy with physicality and sitting in his gaps and he and he really struggled with that but like brunson is built like a pit bull man this guy yeah. is like you, you can't bump him off his spot he's bumping you off your spot i still I, there was a there was a bump midi where he put jimmy butler on the floor like jimmy butler's a big dude mm -hmm. so uh that that's the thing for me like brunson the physicality man with his skill set is just like it's it's like he was built to play in the playoffs yeah well, I think that that's a great point, and like that is something that specifically I love about how he projects, and when we're talking about that floor in the playoffs, things go wrong in the postseason, and teams are dialed in defensively in a way that they aren't in the regular season, and everybody's objective is basically to make you uncomfortable, and the reality is, no matter what you're ceiling, you're right, we did have this conversation last time, and the Donovan Mitchell playoff experience has been very bipolar. It's 2020, 2021, the guy goes absolutely nuclear because he's making all those pull-up threes. Last two runs, he really struggles because he's missing all those pull-up threes. And the reality is, when things are off schedule, and you can't rely on maybe that volume pull-up shooting from deep in the same way, game to game, to have the depth of counters, to have the poise and the pace, and to have the physical imposition that Brunson does, it's just so valuable to me. Like, that is a dude who is built to be a playoff riser, who is built to be a dominant playoff performer, and that's the thing. Last year, Brunson didn't shoot well from deep. He didn't shoot well from deep, and he was in this clogged up environment with bad spot-up shooters, a second star who was failing him, and he still gave you an efficient 28 a night. Like that to me is just the testament to a guy who has all of the traits that I'm looking for to thrive. So that is why I don't disagree on the Mitchell ceiling point, but 
I think I lean towards the guys with super consistent floors, obviously presuming that floor is still quite high as it is for Bronson, just because I know that it's going to be about, okay, who can get consistently to these bread and butter shots when in and around the paint when other things aren't working. And that's where I just, I love Brunson. And against everybody else, like Kyrie's pure shot making is ridiculous. But I do think Brunson is capable of carrying a different sort of load as we're seeing right now. I think that he is probably a higher level playmaker. And I do like his physicality as well. So I have Brunson five among all guards. Logan, I know you said you have him in the same spot, but what's your thoughts on him versus some of these other guys? I mean, I think the Mitchell one is interesting, and I know we did have this, but to me, Brunson's Captain Rock fight. You know what I mean? Like, in those clogged up lanes, like, we've seen what Mitchell, like, I I honestly think it's really easy to do this thought exercise because the Cavaliers and Knicks were built so similarly last season in terms of the kinds of offenses that they were attacking. Uh, You know, Mobley and Allen, too, we saw that. Mitchell wasn't getting downhill or trying. He (laughs) literally... From the third to fourth quarter, he just iced everybody out and said, all right, guys, I'm, I'm literally just going to hit some – I'm going to take ten sidestep threes. If I hit them, we're going to win. If I miss, uh, we're going to lose. And that's the difference with Brunson is, like, he just never stops getting downhill. He never stops generating high-quality shots for himself or for his teammates. And that physical imposition is going to win out every time. And I want to speak to a point, uh, a stat that you brought up, Tyler. The pace thing with the Knicks is interesting because – That, to me, says that the Knicks can physically impose themselves in a way that makes you play Knicks basketball. And it's going to be ugly. It's going to be disgusting. But they are going Mm -hmm. to force you to play their brand. We're going to slow it down. We're going to play great defense. We're not going to let you get out in transition and play up-tempo. We're going to slow this game down. And guess what? We have a great defense. And then on offense, we have the perfect guy to thrive in this sort of environment in this tempo that we as a team are going to set. And I didn't have the Knicks in my top 10 contenders. God, I wanted to. If Julius Randle was healthy, (laughs) I said this on the show, I would have had the Knicks probably three or four. And the reason they weren't on my list is just because there's no world in which I see the Knicks actually winning the title. That's why I didn't put them on the list. But can they make a run? Yes. Can they win a series? Yes. Like, the Knicks are a tough, tough out, man. And... It's all because of, I mean, it starts with Jalen Brunson. I want to give, you know, their defense is great. I think Tibbs has done a phenomenal job with his group. Uh, It starts with Jalen Brunson, man. And like I said, like if the Knicks can establish their brand of basketball on a team, that's a really tough environment to succeed in, man, where I think Brunson's just built to. Yeah, they're built to grind out games. It's kind of a classic formula. We don't see it all that much anymore, but the elite team defense and the one great half-court creator it's fun to watch a team try to succeed with that formula in the playoffs. I think there's a ceiling on it, but I also think nobody wants to play the Knicks even without Julius Randle. Before we move on from all the Brunson love, I'm just curious. Obviously, he's not going to make any legitimate push for MVP. That yeah. is pretty much wrapped up. I think it's obviously going to be Jokic. There's a lot of people who want it to be Luka or Shea or whoever. How many names do you think you can get to in the MVP race, though, before you're at Brunson? Ooh. He's got to be five, right? I think I'd have Brunson, like, in my five spot. I think I'd go Jokic. I think I'd go Luka or Giannis. I'd go SGA, and then Brunson's in my five spot. Like, I don't know. I think that's where I'd have him. Man, that's tough, man, because I, I, I see the vision, and I think – um. I don't know, because it's tough, because I, I really thought Kawhi was up there before he got mm-hmm. hurt, and then that kind of, like, felt, the Clippers season kind of, like, fell apart a little bit. Obviously, they're still where they're at, but um, another tough one for me is Tatum, because yeah. I, I think Tatum has been incredible, and I think, I mean, the Celtics have been historically good, and what's tough for me is is balancing that, because I think sometimes people look at the team and give Tatum so much credit, they're like, I mean, how could he not be the MVP or why is he not? Right. But then there's also the inverse where people are like, well, the Celtics are only good because Tatum, like how many teams in the NBA ask their star player to be their best scorer, playmaker, I mean, lead creator, lead shot maker, and like maybe the most important defender. I don't know if you could say he's the most important defender, but definitely like 
asked to do a, a lot. Really of, high level defense. Exactly. And like, it, it kind of reminds me of the prime LeBron thing where it's like the team obviously is very, very good, but like he is what pulls all of the pieces together. Like, He's the one creating advantages. He's the one shooting almost 40% from three. He's the one getting into the paint every possession. And it's like, I feel like people start to discredit that because of the other guys that he's lifting up in such a good, such a phenomenal way. It's definitely an interesting conversation. I would lean Tatum because I do think this Celtics team is a special team in the scope of NBA history. They're probably going to win 65 games. They are top five all time in point differential per game. And there is definitely this balance, as you mentioned, Tyler, of super talented teams are probably not going to have the MVP when we're talking about like overwhelmingly talented. And it looks different because with the peak Warriors, you're talking about two top five players with the Celtics you're talking about one superstar, but then like four all-star to sub-all-star level players, both cases overwhelming talent, but you always knew that Steph and KD were not going to win MVP. Neither of them were going to make a serious case. It didn't matter if they led the best team ever like they did in 2017. But I think once we get to this level of the conversation, Tatum is just the better player than Brunson, and he is on this great team that although I think he has an overwhelmingly talented supporting cast, of course he is still the most important factor in this equation, and he has consistently been playing at a top 10 level throughout this year. So I think I would have Brunson 6. Kawhi is absolutely the other guy who I would consider. I just think when you consider the burden, the burden on Brunson for half of the year going 18 and 12 without Randall putting up the raw numbers that we're talking about versus Kawhi who has now been missing some games and who never has had that sort of singular responsibility just because of who he has as second and third options I would probably go Brunson at six but he's having a hell of a year man a hell of a year and to think about where he was last year coming off that playoff run I was ready to call him a top 15 player I was so impressed and he has absolutely cemented his status as that because the guy just keeps getting better just getting better year after year after year unreal okay Logan you mentioned leaving the Knicks off of your top 10 contenders list I think this is going to be fun because Last episode, Logan and I did go and rank our top 10 contenders as we are very near the playoffs. And Tyler, I just want your thoughts on this. We can go topic by topic. You pick whatever interests you. I want your reaction. Here's my top 10 contenders. Number one, Denver Nuggets. Number two, Celtics. Three, Mavs. Four, T-Wolves. Five, the play-in Lakers. Six, Thunder. Seven, Bucks. Eight Clippers, nine Sixers, ten Heat. Logan, do you have yours, or do you want me to read yours off for you? No, I got it. Uh, number yeah. one, I have the Nuggets. Two, I have the Celtics. Three, I have the Mavs. Four, I have the play-in Lakers. Uh, five, I have the Bucks. Six, I have the T-Wolves. Seven, I have the Heat. Eight, I have the Sixers. Nine, I have the Thunder. And at ten, I have the Clippers. Mm. Lots of process there. Here, I'm going to just dm you the uh graphic if you want to i've have got it i've got it up here okay. okay i've got perfect. it um yeah man that's interesting because i i obviously this is this is my favorite exercise every year is like ranking the teams and trying to predict like where everyone's gonna go um what's really tough for me always is how historical precedent sets these things up because it's like um if you look i don't want to say maybe since like 1990 maybe like only two teams have ever won a title without like a bona fide this is a top tier guy mm -hmm. um and that's where i was really battling with the celtics because the other historical precedent is like when teams have this point differential when teams are this good on offense and this good on defense they win the title every time so i feel like there's a clash here because as good as tatum is i think we would all agree is not like a tier one Jokic and be right. Giannis but then on the other end it's like the Celtics are hitting all of these parameters that are like this is an all-time great team so they are actually really interesting to me because I mean it's fresh on our minds the Bucks just whooped them mm -hmm. for like the third time this season and it's like if they get into a series I think the Celtics are the better team but like does Giannis is just Giannis just too good I, like I don't and then with his injury that really shakes things up too right but like 
I feel like I think you guys made a tweet about this about like uh the separation between top two teams and then the rest of the league. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely think like if you pulled a thousand NBA fans, at least nine hundred and ninety of them would have the Nuggets and Celtics top two. Yeah, I feel like that's pretty clear. Um, but wh- where I really get like the philosophical question mark with the whole like top tier star versus phenomenal team is on your list, Carson, where you get Mavericks, Mavericks and Timberwolves. Because mm-hmm. I think as a collective unit, the Timberwolves are the better team. I think they have better depth. I think they're a more versatile defense. Um, I think they probably have more creators just in in like numerically. Obviously, Luca kind of counts as like six creators. Yeah. But like <laughs> uh, just in terms of like all across the board. And, yeah. and, and then it's the star power. Like I think you could make the argument that Kyrie and Luca are the two best players in that series. Um, obviously, Ant, Kyrie go either way on that in my opinion but like right um luca is just a clear notch above everyone in that series so it's like how can you how can you balance that like like the timberwolves are such a good team but like history shows us that you gotta have that tier one guy and luca is clearly a tier one guy right now same thing goes to the lakers lebron and ad even though they're in the play and we know that these top tier guys get it done Mm -hmm. um the one that i question with both you guys is the heat like I see the vision and I almost wonder if it's like this black magic, like, yeah, the heat do it every year. We got to put them on there somewhere. (laughs) Pretty much, pretty much, dude. I don't think the heat are good, but I'm like, I'll be damned if I leave them out of 10. Logan was pissed. Logan has them at six. That's to me where I'm like the talent deficit between these teams is too significant. All of the red flags that I have about the heat as a team being still relatively small, not very athletic, Yeah, they have more secondary shot creation than last year with Rozier and Hero, but, like, still not super consistent, efficient guys. Is Jimmy always just going to turn into a superhero? Can a team always turn from a bad regular season offense to a good one? Can you shoot 45% from three again? For those reasons, I am not as high on them as Logan. At the same time, I do think it's real that, like, they are going to outfox basically everybody. Like, Spolstra's going to have a big coaching edge. He's going to make teams uncomfortable. They are going to grind defensively in a way that basically nobody else will. And the formula of Jimmy elevating to legit offensive number one and Bam ruining people defensively, like, that's why they've been in the Eastern Conference Finals three of the last four years. So I felt like I was sort of at a happy medium, but then I was also like, the Suns, the Pelicans, I kind of feel like these teams are just better than Miami. But I felt like a lot of teams were better than Miami last year, and then they were in the finals. I uh, I wanted to ask Logan specifically because here's what's really interesting to me. The way your list is laid out, you think the Heat are a, a bigger threat in the East than Philly. That's interesting to me. Yeah, I mean – Miami is an interesting case, and like that's what's made that's what made last year so weird too, is because they had so many injuries during the regular season that we underestimated them, and then this year they have a ton of injuries that just make you underestimate them again, and so it's like, yeah, I do believe in playoff Jimmy just ascending to this crazy level. I don't know what he has in his genes. He has that dog. Yeah, he's got that dog. You know that meme with the you know with the rib cage. Yeah, yeah. That's Jimmy Butler, man. Uh. So, yes, I believe in playoff Jimmy. I believe in Bam locking up the other team's best player. I think he can X out that guy. And I think they're way better than last year with Hero, with Rozier, with Kyle Lowry's fat ass not out there, man. With They're better on the wings. They got Haquez, and, you know, I like Jovic a little bit, but I think they're better there. I think Duncan Robinson's better. Like, and, and what really sucks about predicting Miami is in the regular season, not only are they injured, they're also so damn inconsistent. One game, they will look like an absolute world beater. And then the next game, they forgot how to shoot. They forgot how to defend. Like, Miami is such a puzzling beast. When it comes to them versus Philly, because me and Carson hashed this out too, I think that they have the best player out of either of those two teams. I think Joel Embiid is the, you know, best player. But Eyebrow raise moment. That being said, it's like Embiid is not going into the playoffs at 100%. He continuously lets us down in every playoff moment. I'm not expecting that to be any different this year. Will his shot will, I'm not going to say his shot's going to completely leave him, but he's probably not going to hit at the clip he hits during the regular season. He's probably going to turn the hell out of the ball. 
Uh, and he might get hurt again. Like Embiid has shown us these things, and that's his track record. The Heat's track record is that they turn into a top-notch defense, that Jimmy Butler turns into Superman, they shoot the lights out, and Spolstra coaches circles around the other team. And that's what sucks, is the seeding. Miami likely is going to have to go through Boston. Milwaukee is likely going to have to go through, uh, or excuse me, Philly is likely going to have to go through Milwaukee. The thing with, and Boston, I know we're going to talk about this later. I am juiced if we get Boston-Miami, man. I know, Carson, I think you said it was going to go, what, five games? Well, I asked you what's more likely, that it goes seven or that Boston sweeps the heat. And I I think think I probably would pick it to go five. I think it... I think it goes six or seven, man. I'm not taking the heat to get bounced that early. Like, the coaching advantage, too. Joe Mazzula, man, I think he – I don't like Joe Mazzula at all. Like, at all. I, I think Spolster has such an edge there that it can actually swing games. Now, I don't know, man. I, I still have just this level of faith in Miami that they can make some noise, man. I don't know. Tyler, are you – are you closer to having Miami in your top 10 and high on your list, or are you closer to, to leaving them off? I, I think I personally would have them just outside. Like, I would give them the acknowledgement of, yeah, this is real. Um, I, I especially love their defensive principles. Like, it's always amazing in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I just I worry about the level, because I do think I, I loved their run last year, but I do think there was a level of um, getting hot at the perfect time. Like, against oh, yeah. um i can't even remember who they played in the first round for some reason milwaukee milwaukee 40, yeah against 45 percent shot like yeah, yeah yeah then in the series against the knicks who the knicks were clearly the weakest team they played in the east they went cold they shot right. terribly <laughs> and and it was like a grinded out series then when they need the shooting back against boston caleb martin is, is yeah. shooting 70 percent from three um and i think like there was a lot of luck involved in that um, but like at the same time, I don't want to take away from the zone defense completely stonewalling Boston or like mm-hmm. um, finding ways to get Kevin Love on the floor for big minutes. Um, one thing that I think is interesting regarding Philly that people are kind of not talking enough about is how stark of a difference Nick Nurse versus Doc Rivers will be in the playoffs. For like, sure. I can't remember which game it was, but just like a night or two ago. Um, their late game execution under nurse was phenomenal. Like sets every play um, locked in defense. Like it was, it was incredible to watch. And I've never, we've never seen that on it on a Joel Embiid team. So what if this is his like tour de force playoff run? Like what if they get in Nick nurse has all of these creative X's and O's and teams can't load up on Embiid and he's just killing these older bigs in the East. Um, Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I have to consider. Also, I like how you mentioned Pelicans, Suns, because, like, those teams are both, like, pretty explosive. Like, the Pelicans with Ingram in the lineup have been one of the best teams for a pretty extended stretch now. Like, yeah. I think I think they have, like, the fourth or fifth best net rating in the league. Um, So they're incredible. I wanted to ask Carson, too. Uh, yeah. Regarding 5-6 and six, Lakers Thunder, um, is that ordered in that way because you think the Lakers are just a better overall team or is it because you think in a Lakers Thunder matchup the Lakers match up better very good question I think the second was at the very least the tiebreaker for me I was just like if this was the first round matchup which it's probably not going to be it looks like the Thunder are probably going to finish in that three seed although who knows they're a game back T-Wolves Nuggets play tonight one of those teams is going to lose I just think we have seen the overwhelming size advantage, the physical maturity that the Lakers have. Like, that's just such a bad matchup for OKC. So that was part of it. But also, I know that it's after they've lost two games, which, by the way, were two meaningful games because the Lakers could be sitting pretty in the seven seed right now, controlling their own destiny, or at the very least in the eight seed. But they don't have LeBron against the T-Wolves. AD gets hurt early in that game, and then they don't have AD against the Warriors, who also shoot 63% from deep, which was absolutely ridiculous. And so now the Warriors have the tiebreakers over them. Like, the Lakers could be the 10 seed, and if they have to go on the road and win two play-in games and then face probably either Minnesota or Denver on the road in the first round, like, guys, the most likely outcome here is that the Lakers don't get out of the first round. And I'm aware of that, but to me, that is much more a product of 
the path which they have set up for themselves through all of these various things, right? Poor effort for a significant portion of the season being the biggest one. Poor coaching as well. Weird lineup stuff. But I still believe in that formula, especially because of what they've been doing offensively in this second half of the year. LeBron is playing at such a ridiculous level there, and I think his improvement as a jump shooter has been sustained for so long this year that we just have to believe it. And then when it comes to mismatch attacking, what he can do out of the post, hunting switches, facilitating for his teammates in those spots, I just think LeBron gets you a good shot when he wants. And I think AD, there's always going to be some up and down there offensively, but the ceiling is high. Defensively, he is still the guy who I would want for a playoff run. I like them a lot more with Rui in that starting five. And I just think the shooting, the secondary creation, there's just so much more offensive pop than these recent Lakers teams that we've seen where it's like, can we grind it out with our defense, but we're probably going to have no creators outside of LeBron and AD and struggle to shoot the ball. There was an improvement there last year, but I think this is the best version of these Lakers offensively. My concern is the point of attack defense because I'm not super optimistic about Vando coming back. It's possible. If he does, the Lakers have a super high defensive ceiling because he is like a rare sort of hound there. You obviously lose a little something offensively, and there are certain matchups in which maybe you're losing too much value offensively. But I just believe in that two superstar formula, especially when it's two superstars who complement each other in the way that one will dominate the defensive side of the ball, the other one will dominate the offensive side of the ball, and they're both going to do it with just physical force in overwhelming size like that translates to the playoffs and okc i love dude they're gonna win titles like there's just no doubt they are a modern basketball utopia but right now i do worry about that physical immaturity i worry about how small they are at this stage i worry about just a team with no playoff experience and even though giddy has been like way better as of late i still worry honestly about giddy being in like your core five because i think there are worlds in which all of a sudden he can't knock down a spot up jumper again and he is completely lost his touch from floater range and around the rim which really hasn't been that good over the course of the year it's been better as of late and then you're playing an offensive minus and a defensive minus and uh gordon hayward unfortunately i thought was going to be the solve but yeah. hasn't shown that yeah. he can be that so that's kind of the overall it is about the matchup, but I am still in on the Lakers, even though their path is just brutal. I wouldn't want to see them. Yeah, man, the thing about OKC, I I, I love how you mentioned the physicality because that's like where the, I've been so back and forth on them for probably months now where I'm like, okay, they only really play one center. I wouldn't even call Jay Will a true center. Um, no. They really only play one center in Chet Holmgren, and he has his own physical He's limitation 90 pounds <laughs> not a great rebounder can't bang in the post but then the other side of me is like they've probably defended Jokic better than any team in the league this year and and it's through like the the aggre like all of the length the aggressive trapping like I, I think mm -hmm. I think Jokic has like two games against the Thunder this season with at least five or six turnovers and it's like they're just they're, they're so unique man like there's no team yeah, like are. the thunder on either end of the floor and i think that's gonna be a really weird thing for like we talk about playoff experience but like none of these teams have experience dealing with a team like the thunder so it's gonna be weird to see how what kind of adjustments they force teams to make um another interesting thing i noticed on these lists is logan seems to still be all the way in on the bucks i want to i want to hear I mean, not all the whoa, way. Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, whoa. Time out, time out, time out. I could never be all the way on a team coached by Doc Rivers. <laughs> top five, I, though. Top five. I want to be clear about this. I don't think the Bucks are a top five team in terms of ability. The only reason that they're there is because I think the East is comically weak. Yeah. Uh, there's a The East is such a weird variable because there's these teams that I could see, like Miami last year, getting hot and having a run and just getting hot at the right time. Like, Philly is a huge variable. Miami is a huge variable. The Knicks, to me, are a huge variable in which I can see them having a great series and knocking somebody off that I consider to be a real contender out. But when I look at teams who can really win the title in the East, it's still only Boston and Milwaukee because, uh, like you mentioned, Tyler, with the uh, philosophical, uh, you know, you got to have one of these top guys. Mm -hmm. Boston, overwhelming talent. 
Milwaukee has Giannis. Like, I don't think Milwaukee's going to win the title. Boston is still my front runner out east, but they're up that high because, to me, <laughs> Milwaukee's real only competition is beating Boston, and they've had their number all year long. Like, it's not a faith in them. I would probably have... Like, I'm trying to think about other teams out west that I like more than them, like... Minnesota? Yeah, I think I like Minnesota more mm -hmm. than them. Uh, Minnesota's their, interesting, man. Yeah, with their defensive ceiling, with Nas Reed balling out, with Carl Anthony yeah. Towns coming back, with all of their length and size. But Milwaukee and Boston are the only teams out east that I can really see winning the title. I can see these other teams that I mentioned, the Phillies, the Miamis... The Knicks, I can see them pulling off an upset in the first round or something like that and pulling something out of their ass. But Milwaukee and Boston are the only teams that I can really see winning the title. So if Milwaukee can escape, you know, there's there's a chance. Just because Giannis and Dame are mm -hmm. so overwhelmingly dominant. Yeah. Like, there are so many yeah. red flags with this team, but it's like I can still see that formula working in, in some simulations. So I got to put credence to them, but... No, man, I'm not all the way in on Milwaukee, man. They still got that boy Doc Rivers. I'm I'm cautious, but uh, I'm still a little optimistic about Milwaukee, man. There's always a really high ceiling when you have two players the caliber of Damon Giannis. You know, the, the, the Bucks right now really remind me of the 2014 Heat, where it's like you have this one overwhelmingly dominant player and all of these aging pieces around him, like Brooke Lopez would be Bosh, Wade, Dame, mm -hmm. and then it's like the Heat obviously – like seemed at face value like this team isn't actually that good but then you get into the playoffs and they kind of ran through the east until they ended up dealing with the beautiful game spurs which in this case would be the denver nuggets i feel like mm -hmm. but uh um one one like i don't want to call it an elephant in the room but there's a team that has not been mentioned at all um that i feel like a lot of people would have had as like a top seven contender two or three months ago and that's cleveland um yeah. and i think like darius garland having this weird regression has really kind of like made their ceiling just because they they were they were like a serious thing especially la like most of last year up until the Knicks series and then this year when garland got hurt they went like 20 and one starting yeah. dean wade at the four and then dean wade is like the defensive player of the year out of nowhere. And it's like, what are we doing? Um, I, I think Cleveland's interesting because I think since Donovan Mitchell got back, um, he hasn't looked anywhere near the same. Yeah. But like, I feel like the recipe is still there. Like, I think they added a lot more shooting. They added Struis and Yang, um, which was kind of their biggest weakness last year. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you get like a healthy Garland Mitchell Mobley, um, like anything can happen with that team because we know they can defend um the best of the best like i think they're probably more equipped to guard Giannis than any other team in the east um and then if the shooters are hitting man like if dean wade is shooting 40 percent from three if max Struess is hitting whatever he did against dallas like th that team is that team i feel like has a recipe i just think uh they haven't gotten the, the timing right yet Timing is an interesting way of putting... I, I'm a real Cleveland skeptic. I think that 22-1 and one run showed you they have a fundamental roster construction issue. And I think you make a good point. Like, I think they improved with their shooting, but those guys are such negatives on the other side of the ball, right? Like, you do have Dean Wade, and you do have Georges Niang, and you do have Struess, but these are all guys who aren't that athletic. They aren't great defenders. And so, to me, it says you need to blow something up. And if that's dealing Garland and if that's dealing Jared Allen, like, I think you make Donovan Mitchell or Garland like your official point guard. Give them shooting and give them guys who can shoot and defend, and you have a recipe to win games. I also think they had a kind of easy stretch of their schedule. They beat some, you know, less than teams during that stretch. But I think it just showed that Cleveland needs to make a decision, you know? Like, and I, I don't know, because I, I think if they trot out Garland, Mitchell, uh, Allen Mobley, I think it's going to be exactly how it was last year, where it's just ugly, it's clogged up. I think they just need more spacing, man, and more 3 and D guys. Like, I don't know, that's where I come. I don't really consider, I don't know, man. I'd have Cleveland behind Golden State. I'd have Cleveland behind Phoenix, even. I'd have Cleveland behind New Orleans. I, I don't know. I don't really have Cleveland anywhere close to, like, my real contender tier. Man, it's tough. I, I think... <sighs> It's tough for me because 
I think that stretch showed some, I do agree, like, it was a weaker point in the schedule, but I also think it showed that, like, they have a ton of lineup flexibility, and I almost feel like JB Bickerstaff right now is kind of capping that because we're not seeing the same lineups that were working. Like, I, I don't know who posted this, but it was, like, the lineups with the 10 best net ratings in the league over a certain amount of possessions, and the Cavs were third, and it was, like, Mitchell, Struess, Okoro, Wade, Allen. Mm -hmm. And it's like Garland and Mobley aren't even a part of that. And right. I almost wonder, like, if it, if it comes down to it, like, would... I think the big question mark with them is would Bickerstaff be willing to bench Mobley and Garland to close a game? Because like those two obviously have a phenomenal recipe with like the pick and roll. They have great chemistry. And I think like when you stagger, like you can get 20 minutes of Garland and Mobley that are going to kill bench units. And it's like down the stretch, I feel like they force the, the big four to all be on the floor at the same time. And it's like, maybe you can get Sam Merrill on the floor instead of Garland. Maybe you can get Dean Wade on the floor mm -hmm. instead of Mobley. And I think that is, for me, the big thing. Like, will they be willing to try out these different lineups that have been proven to work for extended stretches? It's a super interesting point. I do think it also speaks to Logan's point, though, which is you have not built the most cohesive team you could have. If you were going to say, hey, let's get four ascending all-star caliber players, which I think they were all considered when they made the Mitchell move. Allen was coming off of an all-star season. Mobley was this rising potential superstar talent because you do have two primarily on-ball shot creators, small guards, and then you have two unskilled offensive bigs who are obviously going to have a really high level of impact defensively. And so we saw last year that Ultimately, they were just way too reliant on the shot creation of those two guards. And specifically, because the spacing wasn't good, they were getting lulled into these tough pull-ups. And Mobley and Allen both just got dogged in that series. I mean, first of all, you have the issues in terms of spacing they present, but they weren't finishing well. They weren't rebounding well. It was just a horrible look for basically all the Cavs last year. I do think that that was kind of a worst-case scenario. My biggest concern for them is Donovan Mitchell just because he's not Donovan Mitchell right now. And mm -hmm. when he's played six of the last 21 games and over those six games, 14 points per game on 47% true shooting. It's like with a week left, is he going to make the sort of turnaround just in terms of health that they need? I'm not optimistic and I'm not high enough on the healthy calves for me to then put them in there. I certainly think they're better than last year. Because, like, the lack of wing skill was such a red flag last year. And it's better this year. It's better with Struess. It's better with Nyang. I, Okoro is just a significantly better player. Dean yeah. Wade is a better player. And even in terms of guard depth, just, like, some of the diamonds in the rough they found with Merrill, with Craig Porter Jr., like, props to the Cavs. The fact that they are going to win 47, 48 games when everybody's been hurt. Like, they have just had such a difficult season. That is an accomplishment, but I do not like how they look heading into the playoffs. I think they're 10 and 16 post All Star break, 20th in offensive rating, 24th in defensive rating. And of course, Mitchell has missed a majority of that stretch, but they're just very much trending in the wrong direction for me. So that's why I have them off. Yeah, I think we've covered pretty much every play in okay. playoff team you've got like uh orlando i don't think any of us would would say orlando's a serious threat to do anything it's just like props to them great season they're gonna get yeah. probably dog walked by one of the superstar teams um yeah. even but if they'll they do... suck to play in the first round they, oh. and they'll suck for one of those good teams to play absolutely and and when yeah. when they unleash 30 minutes per game jonathan isaac i i'm scared <laughs> i'm scared for whoever for real, bro. Faced him been waiting five years for it but yeah. they're they're tuning up to it dude no. it's actually dumb the defensive talent and length that orlando has like sugs it's, at the point of attack no. paolo franz wendell I, it's dumb man. and their their average age of their rotation is like 23 it's, it's yeah <laughs> it is ridiculous um another one is sacramento I, I again it's the same thing as last year like props to sacramento good team they're not a good playoff matchup for anyone unless they face the Lakers, in which case they'll probably sweep them. Um, but that's, that's, that's about <laughs> without it. Without Malik, man, without Malik, like, he was so vital yeah. to them making that a good series against the Warriors. Like, just being that level pull-up shooter, creating that level of penetration, even being a capable playmaker where he's just gotten better. I just think 
that they're too reliant on Fox having to go nuclear and there's a lot of teams with physical advantages. So shout out to the Kings, but I don't view them as a threat. I am curious. You briefly mentioned Minnesota. They might be the most interesting team to me because they're sort of like this massive contradiction in terms of playoff precedence. Because one thing I've always been adamant about is you mentioned when you're talking about title potential, you got to have that tier one guy. And also you just have to be a good half court offense and you have to have a really high level offensive creator in the half court. And I love Ant. I do not think he is at the consistency level in terms of playmaking and in terms of pull-up shooting he would need to be for me to consider him like one of those super reliable half-court offensive engines and then they just haven't produced very efficiently there. At the same time, they are this rarely great defense. Like The gap between them and the second best defense in the league in terms of defensive rating is the biggest we've seen since the 1994 Knicks who existed in an entirely different basketball landscape but nevertheless one of the very rare teams who was able to make the finals with a mediocre offense because they were just so great defensively. So where do you fall on that Timberwolves spectrum? Like how many teams out West would you take above them? Man, I'm loud in my praise of the Timberwolves, praise of Rudy Gobert. I know. Um, I have been since the moment Gobert got traded. Um, I never lost faith. I, last year was a little rough. I never lost faith. Um, man. That, that team is just so interesting because the double big experiment um, that everyone said was a complete failure actually turned out to be <laughs> the greatest thing in sports. Um, <laughs> and then when you throw in a third big, Nas Reed, who can play the five or the four, um, is maybe the most skilled center, like perimeter-oriented center in the league right now. Like, it's actually yeah. ridiculous. Um, you got... They added Monte Morris as a backup point guard for Conley. So that's two guys who don't turn the ball over, don't make errors, and are just very smart game managers mm -hmm. next to an explosive Anthony Edwards who can probably get you 33, 35 points per game in a playoff series mm -hmm. pending his pull-up shooting. Yeah. Um, Man, it's interesting. I think, like, just throwing it out there, like, you asked me how many teams in the West I would take over Minnesota. It's one. I, I think Denver is the best team in the West. And I think, interestingly interestingly enough, Minnesota is the team that I would take to knock off Denver. Like, um, even over Boston, I think Minnesota matches Ooh. up with Denver better than anyone in the league. And it's because of the, the, su the super weird combination of size yeah. and then Edwards' pick-and-roll-oriented um, attack. It's They're so fascinating and... Um, I think they pose an interesting threat for every team because it's like you have to have the offense to at least give yourself a baseline. Like we were just talking about how Jalen Brunson gives you a floor. Like could, what does the floor look like against Minnesota? Like, I don't know if you can really like it, it, it. There's not a guy in the league. I think you have to have like that ceiling pusher to actually score against Minnesota. Like you need a Steph Curry pull up shooting. You need Luka Doncic in his mm -hmm weird offensive mastery um to actually like get a baseline of a good offense against minnesota but then you also have to have def a defender athletic enough to not let Ed edwards just get a paint touch every single possession like mm -hmm. when you look at dallas is pj washington that guy to keep edwards from touching the paint every play i don't know is like ah man it it's interesting but i think like I think Minnesota is a walking matchup problem. And I think like people are really going to see that in the first round. They are a matchup problem. That is exactly how I would put it. I was trying to figure out how to like title this breakout clip. We just did about them. And I was like, how do I basically get nightmare to play in there? Because nobody is going to want to play the Timberwolves, bro. They are uncomfortable. And you're right about the too big setup. Like it, Feels counterintuitive in the modern NBA, even though obviously Cat is so extremely skilled. But at the same time, the best teams right now, most of them are huge. And that's where Minnesota matches up extremely well against these other huge teams. You talk about OKC guarding Jokic well, just in terms of their peskiness, their length, what they can do bothering him with doubles and whatnot. But there's no question to me, Minnesota is the team that guards Jokic best in the NBA we saw it in last year's playoffs. Obviously, he was still unreal, but like nobody took a more significant chunk out of his efficiency at the very least. I really think Cat on him physically as a post defender 
can hold up better than like most teams best option and then that allows them to put Gobert in the Roma role where he is at his absolute best because nobody is going to actually give Jokic trouble in single coverage if you have Gobert there at the very least right taking away those passes to Aaron Gordon able to help over it's more effective than the alternatives the reason I have Dallas above them it's so tough because for a long stretch this year I felt Minnesota was the second best team in the West when I see the sort of superstar shot creation that you're getting from Dallas right now with a capable level of uh, defense. Like, they're actually defending well. What they've done in the front court being so much bigger and more athletic there than they were. And then you can get a run like you're going to get from Luka and Kyrie. The ceiling there is just immense. And I think somebody has to explode if you want to beat Denver. Yes, Minnesota is best positioned to, like, take a chunk out of seven eight percent of their offensive efficiency but i don't know that anybody is like meaningfully slowing the nuggets down just because i think Jokic creates a good shot so consistently they don't rely on shot variants from the three-point line in the same way that other teams do i kind of feel like you might have to just go nuclear on them and uh I don't love how the Mavs match up in terms of size against the nuggets it's better than it was but i still don't love it but I don't think anybody can go nuclear like Luka and Kyrie can. And that's kind of the tiebreaker for me. I do still believe consistent, great half-court offense matters for teams that are trying to contend. And the Mavs are just so resoundingly checking that box right now. I want to add a couple of things you guys mentioned with the matchups against uh, Denver. Oklahoma City and Minnesota both had winning records versus Denver this year, both 2-1. and one. Uh, Jokic had three or more turnovers in every game. Uh had six against Minnesota, had seven in that game you mentioned, Tyler, against uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, so I want to ask both of you guys then. I know you are talking about that number one option against Denver. You don't think Anthony Edwards causes, like, a, a real matchup problem um, against Denver's, like, perimeter defenders? Like, I don't know, because if you're talking about those guys, I, obviously Dallas has more offensive creation. Like, can anybody stay in front of Ant on Denver? I mean, in last year's playoffs, it certainly looked like nobody yeah. could i also wonder i also do think edwards had an incredible shot making series that year For um sure. with the mid-range game the the pull-up threes and i think that's tough to replicate because i don't think he's a steph curry level shooter um but like in terms of just dribble penetration like you said they didn't have anyone who could stay in front of him like when it was yeah. kcp he wasn't big enough like that was a big body when it was aaron gordon aaron gordon just isn't agile enough um, and then who can who else can you put on him? Like Peyton Watson, I don't think could really do anything against Anthony Edwards. I mean, you don't definitely don't want Michael Porter Jr. on him. No. Um, I do think that's a tough question with uh the dribble penetration because that's where Minnesota would find offense is Anthony Edwards consistently putting Denver in rotation. Um mm -hmm. another good thing that I was thinking about uh, when Carson was talking about the difference between like Luca and Kyrie creating in a specifically in a Timberwolves and Mavs series um I find the thing I find most interesting is Luka Doncic because I think the Mavs are very much reliant on Luka to do his thing like I feel like when he's off like their offense is just kind of like not anywhere near its ceiling um because he has to do so much with the ball he has so much responsibility mm -hmm. and I feel like one of the one of the greatest things we look at with Luka is the fact that he is this pick and roll master of like no coverage is a good option. Like you hedge him, he's creating a four on three, uh, right. he's hitting an open dunk or a skip to a shooter. You play drop, he's got the pull up three or he'll get into the defense and get to his mid range game. What I think though is specifically against Luca, the best defense you can play against him is perfect drop. Like drop close to the level, perfect drop. Don't give him the lob, keep it a 2v2. And, like, who better in NBA history to do that than Rudy Gobert? And that, mm -hmm. to me, is what makes it really interesting. Because if you have Jaden McDaniels hounding this guy, Anthony Edwards hounding this guy, and Gobert's playing perfect drop, like, all of a sudden, some of those advantages that comes with the Mavs, like, pick it, get a screen, skip, and then defense and rotation, that kind of gets nullified a little bit. And I think that becomes a chess match of, like, Luka versus Gobert in pick and roll. Who wins the matchup? It is absolutely true that Minnesota is best equipped in terms of 
like you say, basically playing perfect drop in that matchup. Like Jaden is just going to be ferocious with that pursuit, uh, with that backhand pressure. Like Gobert obviously is massive. His length, his positioning is all perfect. But when it comes down to who wins out that battle, I kind of take the unbelievable shot maker who's also 6'8 and stronger and basically just plays with this perfect pace. I do feel like there is a level of offensive greatness that can kind of outweigh any level of defensive greatness. And uh, that's the level that Luca's at. Like he's just one of those rare, rare guys. So Logan, I know that you also have the Mavs. First of all, Tyler, would the Mavs be your third team out West? Who would be your third team? I think so. I think so. I I think like, man, the West is just, I feel like it's such a bloodbath, man. Like it is. The healthy Clippers are still there. Like you mm-hmm. meant, like we mentioned teams that kind of got skipped over. Pelicans, Suns are still there. Lakers, yeah. Warriors are in both in the play in. Like you still have OKC. Like no, the West is just the West is just insane. I, I think if I had to like gun to my head, Dallas would probably be my number three. But like, man, OKC is right there. Um, mm-hmm. I think OKC is right there. Man, it's tough. I just can't wait to I just can't wait to watch it unfold. Seriously. And I think to the point about Luca too, I agree. I think just Minnesota, dude. I, I don't. I've never seen a team with like this kind of defensive ceiling. With like in a dub, McDaniel's, all those guys are crazy. If Luca's also hitting like thirty-five plus, like to forty percent of his step back threes too, I almost think it's like it doesn't matter. Like he's yeah. gonna, yeah. he's gonna get his own. Um, yeah, dude, the, that's what made, and that's, again, that's, that was kind of the crux of, like, why I had the Bucks up so high, man. Like, the West is just going to eat itself up, dude. Some of these great teams out West, I mean, we kind of knew this coming into the regular season. Like, if you told me that Phoenix, L.A., and Golden State, all teams who I was very high on were all going to be in the play-in, I would have smacked you and told you you were, you know, talking mess. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous. This is, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm back in. We're talking about historical stuff, man. I feel like I'm back in like the cutthroat late 2000s, early 2010s of the West, man, where we got the Spurs, the Mavs, the Lakers, the Thunder. It's just deep, man, and every series is going to be an absolute war. What's so interesting is it feels different to me than the heyday of the West that you kind of refer to there, Logan, because there were years where you had like three juggernauts, right? You have the Mavs the Suns and the Spurs overlapping. And it's like, all these teams are powerhouses. They're all way better than anybody else out East. Or you have, I think about during the Warriors reign, and yet you still have the 67 win Spurs and the 65 win Rockets. And you have the KD Russ Thunder before he obviously leaves. And it's like, there are multiple powerhouses. This year it's different because it's like, there's one powerhouse. And then there are eight teams where I'm like, boy, they're not that far apart. Like, they're all legitimately good. And so the margins in that sense are as slim as I can think of them being. Like, what it took for the Clippers to fall for my second team out west to whatever I have them at. I think my sixth team, and I'm still a little worried about that because it's like, boy, Kawhi is crazy. And, like, if Harden doesn't have an aneurysm, like, (laughs) that's a lot of shot creation. And if they dial in defensively, like we saw it, bro, they were beating everybody for two months. It is a very, very unique landscape in that sense. And it's going to be fascinating. What I find, I'm so excited because I just know at least one of these Western Conference uh, first round matchups is like, because we're expecting them all to be just this bloodbath. I know there's going to be at least one first round matchup that is just a blowout. And it mm-hmm. just came out of nowhere. Like, yeah, kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say the Nuggets and Lakers conference finals was a, was a blowout, but like they, they made easy work and it's like, it a sweep. Yeah. there's going to be a series like that, that out of nowhere, like, I don't know what it'll be. I don't know if it'll be Mavs Clippers or, uh, Thunder versus whoever is in six right now. I think it might be, I don't even know who, who is in six the right Pelicans, now. The Pelicans. The Pelicans. Are in the six yeah. Right if it's now. Thunder and Pelicans, like, I don't know. One of these matchups is going to be a dog walk and everyone's going to be like, Oh, this team's like kind of scary. 
The NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up by betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. That's only a DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. If the seeding held as it is right now, which first round series across both conferences would you be most excited for? Yeah, when I first started pondering this question, I looked at the standings and I realized that this is shaping up to be the greatest playoffs of all time. Like I saw, <laughs> I was like, wait, every single uh, matchup in the East is somehow storied. Like, uh, at the time I looked, I think it was a Cleveland and New York rematch. I think it was the only one that I kind of was, like, overlooking was Orlando and Indiana. Um, not because of any, like, basketball-related reasons. More so that, like, uh, it just wasn't – there was no, like, history there. But then you got Heat Celtics. You got Buck Sixers. Buck Sixers sounds like a blast. Um, yeah. Hopefully Giannis is available for that. Um, But then in the West, you have – what, you got – Right now, assuming the play in doesn't change, because I'm gonna Lakers and Warriors are nine and ten, but I'm just gonna assume they're nine and ten. Yeah. Uh Wolves and Kings is cool. Um, but again, not no like history there. Uh yeah. Nuggets and Suns rematch. That's that's a good one. Fun. That's a yeah. good one. Um, like we just talked about OKC and New Orleans. But uh I think the answer for me out west is Clippers and Mavs. Like, come yeah. on. Like Luca's revenge. Is this Luca's revenge finally? That I, did both of their last series go to ga- go to seven games, or was the one in the bubble six? Bubble was six. Next year was seven. Okay, and Luca was just absolutely ridiculous in both of the. I mean, in the twenty twenty one series, they were playing Boban. They were like that. That, that Mavs team had no business going to seven games. Yeah. Um, and Luca is just like this superhero in those series. And now that Dallas has the squad, now that he has that number two. Like, I feel like this is shaping up to be, like, the breakthrough. And uh, I think that'll be just the best first-round series. It's got to be. I mean, two L's, and then, you know, you just think about, like, Luka's mentality, man. He's got that – there's going to be a chip on his shoulder. Like, he is out for, for blood against his team. And I think they match up really well against each other basically because, I don't know, they're constructed in really similar ways. You know, they got star shot creators – They've got shooting around them, and then you got the big guys in the middle. Like, and my question really is: is like, can anybody hold Luca? Like, even and that's no disrespect to Kawhi or PG, but it's like, can they really effectively slow down what Luca does? That's, I, 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 dude, you said it, man. I mean, this is shaping up to be one of the best playoffs ever, dude. I'm so <laughs> juiced for all these series: Boston and Miami, Philly and Milwaukee, LA and Dallas has to be the one though, and. I, like I, I mean, you could glean this from our contender rankings, though. I'm anticipating Dallas coming out in, on top, but it's it, it's going to be a battle, man. I think that's probably my number one uh, as well, dude. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a ton of fun. This is part of what scares me about having Dallas at three. I would pick them to win this series, but I'm not like resoundingly confident. And this is the first round that we're talking about. This would be my choice as well. For multiple reasons. Number one, you mentioned Tyler, like the history of the beef here, the rivalry. It was as fun a consecutive first round matchup. Like when I think of the best playoff rivalries of the last decade, 15 years that aren't finals matchups. The first one that comes to my mind is Clippers Warriors because those series were like so intense. There was so much hatred and it was just great basketball. But then What we saw in back-to-back years, it's one of the great superhero performances that didn't end in a series win ever. I think about Luka, that game that he had like 41, 17, and 13 and hit that ridiculous step back three. Like that was one of the best shots in performances I've seen in my life. And that was, that was second year Luka. And then it was third year Luka. So I'm super excited for that. These are also just maybe the two most evenly matched teams that we're going to see in a first round draw, which I think is really fun. And I'm fascinated by what the hell the Clippers even try to do with Luka because 
the composition of these teams, although they have the same core faces in terms of Luka and PG and Kawhi, pretty different because in those matchups, Luka kind of forced the Clippers to go into small ball mode. Like they were all in on their small ball lineups then back when they had Batum at the five and they were younger and more athletic all around. But like he was just torching Zoo. And so then you mentioned Tyler, like the Mavs, kind of went huge as a counter to that being like, all right, Boban, like you're just going to score against these small ball lineups. And now it's a different configuration for both these teams. The Clippers can't go small like they used to because they don't have Batum. The small ball lineups just don't work in the same way. And uh, I'm really, really confident that Luka is just going to give them the business kind of no matter what, like he's just on such an unconscious level. I also think it's a good test to see like, all right, how legit is this Dallas defense? Like, are these wings capable when we're talking about Derek Jones Jr. and PJ Washington of checking Kawhi and PG for an entire series? So I think it's going to be telling in terms of like what both these teams are cut out for. Because if you get through this series, like that reflects on you pretty well as a basketball team. But then also the history is just awesome. My other choice would be Buck Sixers. Just because I think, first of all, it's just a total kind of seeding anomaly to have two teams of this caliber in the first round because the Sixers are 29 and 8 when Joel Embiid <laughs> plays. So obviously that's not your conventional seven seed. But I think there's a few specific dynamics that are really interesting. First of all, I think it's an opportunity for a huge maxi series. Maxi has just consistently balled out in the playoffs, but like when you think about the weak points of this Bucks defense, first of all, obviously at the point of attack, I think he will just be able to uh, obliterate Dame. And I also think with old slow Brook playing that classic drop coverage, like Maxi getting to that floater range, dude, he is just a master from there. So I think he can go nuclear. Dude, I was just going to mention, and we got the fact that, like, uh, Tyler was talking about storylines. I mean, it's Doc versus his old team. I mean, this is mm-hmm. awesome. Doc versus his old team. Well, Logan, I've got all these bullet points, man, so we don't need to jump all the way to number five. <laughs> and you didn't even mention the Pat Bev revenge series, bro. Yo. That's what we're all really tuning in for. I also think it's a really interesting matchup for Embiid because he hasn't really fared very well against the Bucs in recent years. Since 2020, he's averaging 26 a night on under 53% true shooting. I think a big part of that is just that the Bucs are huge on the front line, and Brook is huge. So even though he is slower-footed, he gives Embiid some trouble just in terms of he doesn't have these same overwhelming physical advantages that he normally does, and he's going to concede some ground to you and kind of force you to beat him with your jump shot, which is the thing that has always failed Embiid. Like, we can talk about a bunch of different factors, playmaking, foul grifting, health, what have you, but his jumper has just fallen off a cliff. So I'm interested in seeing if that can hold up in this run. Also, just Embiid versus Giannis. Like, that's a moment to have those two facing off. Like, talk about battle of the bigs, and to get it in the first round is just kind of ridiculous. And I also think it's just going to be a really good test for the Bucs. I don't know if you can even call it a test because it's not like, oh, this is our warm-up series. Like, let's play our way into playoff form. It's kind of like, all right, you guys need to be as good as you can get right now. And obviously they have not been doing that as of late. So Clippers Mavs would be one for me, but then Bucks Sixers would definitely be number two. 100% agree. 100% agree. Yeah, I concur. I think Dude, I think you hit on the key point. I mean, I think Maxi and that perimeter defense for Milwaukee is kind of the swing thing. Also, wow, dude, I can't believe Milwaukee actually made like an in-season adjustment and chose to start Pat Bev. It's weird how also that game against Boston, I mean, Milwaukee was literally just hitting every shot. I was watching that going, like, when are they going to miss? That that one possession, dude, where Pat Bev, also, we were getting Luke Cornett minutes too. What an ugly Well, yeah, an no ugly Horford, game. no KP. Dude, it's tough to judge. That was the funniest shot I've ever seen, dude, where Pat Bev dribbles Luke Cornett in a circle and then hits a sky hook on him. Like, what are we doing, man? Um, props hoops. to the Bucks for making adjustments, man. I think That's more Pat hoop, Bev bro. minutes, more Andre Jackson Jr. minutes, man. Uh, shout out Doc Rivers and uh, the Bucks for finally making adjustment. It only took them, you know, what, 40 games together? 
Glenn, bro. He's just working his way into postseason form, man. <laughs> I think a lot of the other series are going to be interesting. Like, personally, I would like to see the Lakers in that eight seed. I think they present a more interesting set of problems for anybody than the Kings mm -hmm. without Malik and without Herder. Like, they're just on a different level as a team to me. And it would suck if either the Sixers or Heat somehow lost in the play-in. Like, bro, I'm not trying to see the Bulls, and I no. am not trying <laughs> no. to see... I am not trying to see the Atlanta Hawks, bro. They have just been blech, such I, bad vibes this year. I think uh, I think the most interesting scenario would be Golden State getting the eight against Minnesota because that's like such a clash in styles. Oh my god, like, yeah. Draymond at the five, or, or like Steph's pull up shooting against Gobert's drop. Like, is Gobert going to start mm. blitzing? Like, I think that would be tactically the most interesting one mm. versus eight uh, in the West. Yeah. Steph, not such an ideal matchup for Rudy, I think we've seen over the years. But I also think, like, Minnesota is just so huge, bro. The physical advantages they would have at, like, every position, pretty confident that would win out. But that would be a really interesting well, and, clash of styles. And I was going to say, and also, there's some story there from the beginning of the season with the Jada McDaniels, Clay, True. Draymond choking Rudy Gobert. Like, we, we got an interesting storyline there. Very true, dude. Very true. I also think Lakers T Wolves would be really interesting because it's like, all right, we have these two huge teams clashing and we have the best defense in the league. I also think the Lakers have been a significantly more proven offense, especially as of For late. Sure. And I'm leaning Minnesota. I have them one spot higher in like my contender rankings, but also you talk about the best player on the floor factor. The Lakers would have the two best players on the floor in that series. But then the Timberwolves have three through five by like a huge margin. So I'm so pumped, dude. I'm fired up. And the other thing that there is potential to have happen in this postseason is for some of these stars who maybe have a rough go at it in one series or what have you to prove the slander against them wrong. Tyler, I know that you talked about Gobert, your defense of him. Mm -hmm. I'm interested if he's your choice. Who do you think is that guy this year who proves some of the negative narratives against him wrong? I mean, Gobert always comes to mind when these discussions happen, but that would be my boring answer. Um, okay. For me, it's Zion. I think it's Zion. Um, yeah. I, think, I think there's a stigma that when you aren't a versatile scorer from a levels perspective, it won't hold up in the playoffs. Like I think we kind of saw that with Giannis um, and of course some other guys like slashing guards and things of that nature, John Morant. Um, mm -hmm. But like, man, Zion is just not like any of these guys, the space, the places in which he operates, uh, the combination of burst center of gravity strength uh two foot leaping like we have never seen anything like this and i think he's peaking at just the right time they said he's lost like 25 30 pounds since the start of the season like i think we're going to get into the playoffs and zion is going to look like a just this the force especially if they face okc who we just talked about their biggest problem is physicality yeah. they don't have a power forward so it's like um yeah. Yeah, I think I think especially if they get OKC, Zion is gonna turn heads and people are gonna be like, "Wait, this is why he was the number one pick." I think Zion's a great choice, and if we get that matchup, you know, I think Oklahoma City probably still prevails. But man, New Orleans is a big physical team, dude. Like they it's match not up a good matchup. It's not they a good match up really OKC. well against them. I think my boring answer would be SGA, um, just because I, for some reason people still doubt him. I'll just say two things. Last year, he had the 13th most efficient 30-point-per-game season ever. This season, he had the ninth most efficient 30-point-per-game season ever. Like, I don't know how you can still doubt the guy. For me, I think it's going to be Jason Tatum. I think Tatum finally mm. does it, man, uh, with his improvements in pull-up jump shooting. But moreover... Tatum is a different player, man, in terms of him getting downhill, him getting to the rack, him utilizing the, his post game. Like, I think Tatum is different. And maybe it won't be in the conventional way where he's balling out every single game. Like, I still think we're going to be due for a couple of Tatum games where it's, you know, maybe not the third game, but maybe the fourth or the fifth one uh, consecutively. I, I think because he has such overwhelming talent around him, I think the Celtics are just going to get through the East and that's going to do it. But I also think that... This is going to be the year where Tatum finally plays more consistently and just better. Like, he's stronger, he's bigger, he's more physical. I just think he's 
I think he's improved enough this year where he's really ready for this environment. And I think it's weighed on him a lot as a player. Just the narrative, the like the mounting pressure, the mounting, you know, things against him. I think this is the year where Tatum plays his best playoff basketball ever. Um, I think situation plays into the part of that, but I really do think Tatum's improved enough this year where it's his year to break through and be the guy, man. That's fascinating. Not because I disagree. I think this is the best Tatum that we've ever seen. Just because of the way that I feel like you normally talk about Jason Tatum, Logan, if I'm not mistaken, he wasn't in your top 10 players list, which I think most people would be surprised by. But now you're going to bat for him. I mean, I think he's going to play better than he has in years previous. I don't know if he's even going to play at the level of where he breaks through. I hope he does. I Like, I, I'm rooting for Jason Tatum. Um, I, I don't know where he's going to land on my list after this. And, and like I said, I don't know if he's going to play even better than those guys on my list, but I think he's going to play as the best Jason Tatum we've ever seen in the playoffs. That bar isn't crazy stupid high, but I think this is going to be the best playoff run of Tatum's career, and I think he might finally break through where he's concretely in that in that list. He's improved a lot from last year. Um, he has his flaws, but like I said, man, I think this is the year where Tatum might finally do it and break through. The struggle for him is basically if you don't win it all with this team, it's like impossible. It's a to letdown. Sort of I was, I was public perspective. I was talking about this with uh, some dude I was playing basketball with because I had a Boston beanie on, and he goes, "Oh man, are you from Boston?" And I was like, "Nah, dude, I just got this." At and you said, "Yeah, get in my car. Let's go to Harvard." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I solved the uh, I solved an equation on a chalkboard. That's so um, sick. Yeah, all that's by sick. myself. This was during uh, your janitor gig. Yeah, and then I went and I had a really deep therapy session with this man dressed in woman's clothing. I called no, himself. No, no, you're mixing. You're mixing <laughs> references now. Oh, uh, uh, my bad. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he asked me this, and he goes, "Yeah, man, I think it's going to be really funny because he was a Celtics and a Red Sox fan." And he was like, yeah, man, if the Celtics don't win the finals, he goes, they could lose in game seven on a buzzer beater to a team in the West. And everybody would just go, oh, what a choke. The, another colossal failure by the Celtics. I mean, it is it is interesting. Like, if the Celtics don't win the finals, it is a colossal letdown. It is a colossal failure in the eyes of sports media. It's a high bar. It is a bar that makes sense, though, because they are just so loaded. But I do think this is the best version of Tatum. And honestly, I agree with everybody you guys have thrown out. Like, I had both Shea and Zion on my list. I think there's also just this notion of if you haven't done it in the playoffs, we are not going to give you any credit. And I am a huge believer that playoff basketball is the most important factor in determining, like, a player's greatness, where they should rank. Now, sample size is super important too because sometimes we get a five-game series and then people want to make that the be-all, end-all of a person's career. And it's like, no, that's not accurate. But it is true that playoff basketball will reveal your weaknesses and ultimately reveal how uh, dominant your strengths are in a way that regular season basketball just doesn't. I just think SGA, because he is so versatile as a shot maker, because he is just so damn hard to stay in front of because of how he dominates the painted area, but not just with what you're talking about, Tyler, with like a younger Giannis, right? Where it's like, okay, build the wall, build the wall. And if he is not getting to the rim, he's going to struggle as a scorer. SGA is the best short mid-range shot maker in the league. So just the depth of counters there, like I think he's going to kill it. And even if this isn't the year that OKC makes their deep run, I think SGA is going to be nuts. And with Zion, I'm just excited for him to be like exposed to a national audience again because of course he's had so many health things and I think it has gone underappreciated just how healthy he's been this year. Like that's awesome that we're getting to see Zion play, but it feels like so much of the discourse is, oh, underwhelming considering all the hype, Stephen A calling him fat, whatever. Ha ha, he likes gumbo. He likes jambalaya. Ha ha, he lives in New Orleans. And it's like, guys, he gets where he wants. Like he's a one of one athlete mm -hmm. in the history of the sport. And we continue to see him evolve as a playmaker. There's just not a lot of teams that have anything for Zion Williamson. And he's played better as the year has gone along. So I'm excited for that. Another one who I have, Logan, it's kind of like you saying Jason Tatum. I have Joel Embiid with a question mark here. Ooh. And the reason I say that is 
I've been a big critic of playoff Embiid because I already talked about the reasons that his game has consistently failed him in the postseason. And I am not going to go all in and say, oh, this is the year that everything changes, especially because even though he's looked good, he is still coming off of a significant injury. I just think some of the narratives have gone too far. Like Logan, for example, you saying you would take Jimmy over him in the playoff run. I get that Jimmy has consistently been a playoff riser and Embiid's been a playoff I don't think that's a ridiculous, man. To me, the basketball ability, the ceiling, when we're talking about what these guys are capable of, it's just so vastly different. And I think Embiid is going to come closer to hitting that than he has in previous years because he's better as a playmaker, because even though he was a good jump shooter last year, really good in the regular season, and it still fell apart in the playoffs, he's just continued to get better and better there and having a career season this year. Also, he's in the best condition. It looks like he's slimmer than he's ever been, and I think that that bodes well, and I hope that his body can hold up throughout this run. But we saw some really nice playmaking from him last game. If you can't basically cause his playmaking to crumble, right, double aggressively as we've seen teams do successfully, then he just becomes a whole nother problem. And so I am cautiously optimistic he is going to play better than he has in previous playoffs and that uh, the narrative will uh, come back to a little bit of a healthier midway point where it's not, okay, just because he averages 35 a game in the regular season, he's better than Jokic. I've had enough of those conversations, but I also don't think we need to say this guy isn't a top 10 player and he'll never ever do anything in the playoffs because there's going to be a run where he is making all of his jumpers and then nobody has any answer for Joel Embiid. Yeah. There were also some other names that kind of floated in the back of my head. Um, when you said question mark, it made me think of a guy who has a very good chance but I don't know if he'll do it, and that's Carl Anthony Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah, I, I had him too. Yep. Yeah, it's like uh, the Timber. Like, there's a pathway where he is just scorching hot, and the Timberwolves are running through these teams on both ends, and he like makes his presence known as like this is what everyone envisioned. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other two, I the other two I was thinking of are like a package deal, and it's J Dub and Chet because I feel like all years or throughout the entire year they've been like, uh pegged with this uh they play with shea so they get a lot of easy um mm. but like in the playoffs that's not going to be a thing and i think like those two have a chance to really like make their presence known as true star players next to shea not just role players well and to speak to what carson was saying earlier about zion dude i think you make a great point like i just don't think enough people have watched j-dub or chet play like so many people yeah. and, and you know it's kind of been a hard realization that, that i've come to throughout watching regular season basketball, so many fans don't watch a game until the playoffs. Like, so many people who like the NBA will not tune in regularly to watch a regular season game. And then we get mm -hmm. to this stage, and it's like, oh, wow, this J-Dub dude is really nice, even though we've had, you know, a couple of seasons of watching him. And then Chet in his first full year. Like, I think when people watch Chet, run inverted pick and roll, knock down 40% of his threes on a big stage, I think their jaws are going to drop, and they're going to go, oh, my God. Like like you said, Carson, the, the Thunder are going to win three, four championships over the next 10 years. You know what I mean? They're going to rack it up. They're so talented. This is going to be the first time that people are really exposed to Oklahoma City on a big stage, and I think those are great picks. I think they're going to turn a lot of heads, not because they haven't been doing this consistently, but because so many eyes are finally on the product on a big stage. Yeah, the Thunder are incredible. And that's why I feel like kind of bummed out. I have them at six in my contender rankings, which I, I feel good about, but it's like lower than what their regular season greatness would indicate. But I don't want to be the guy who's ragging on the thunder. I just think there are certain immaturities that are natural for one of the youngest teams in the league that is going to win 55 plus games. Like that's such a rare feat. Chet is going to be a top 10 player in this league, bro. When I saw Chet as a prospect, I called him the best prospect I had ever been able to competently evaluate. That was before Wemby, but I was so high on his skill set, and it's all been realized in year one. Like, this dude is effectively the perfect modern offensive big, if you take out, right, being a Jokic-level passer and difficult shot maker. When you are just thinking about the traits that we value, defensive versatility, high-end rim protection, playmaking, perimeter shot making, 
athleticism and size around the rim as a finisher like he has it all ball handling of course he's exceptional for his size and then j-dub is gonna be all nba and he's gonna be a perennial all-star so everybody should be all in on the thunder long term it doesn't have to be for this year although they are still really good this year but long term man all these dudes are everything that they have been advertised as if not even more cat is a great choice though because Cat just has such a complicated NBA reputation. He was like the chosen one, and he is obviously not the chosen one. At the same time, he is one of the most skilled offensive bigs that we've ever seen. And just in terms of production, like has the best three-point shooting resume of a big that we've seen. And he's been better this year. He's clearly improved defensively. We've just gotten a bad version of him in the playoffs. He hasn't knocked down his shots from the perimeter. He's been turnover prone. He's gotten into foul trouble through offensive fouls and defensive fouls as well. Like, it's just been sort of the ultimate confirmation bias, if we can call it that, because he really hasn't been very good in the playoffs. But people who have this perception of Cat as being soft and not stepping up to the big moment that has been verified by his performance so far but i feel differently about him than i do like a julius randall who is a much more drastic underperformer but it's not like people talk about them that differently it's kind of like underperformer get lumped into the same category randall's been a disaster cat has just underachieved a little bit but where there's skill set stuff right like randall's gonna rely on a bunch of tough pull-up jumpers that he frequently goes ice cold with you can't be like oh my god how did that happen Cat, I just feel like it's a small sample size that doesn't fully represent who he is. But coming off of an injury, that's also where I have the question mark. Like, are we going to get the best Cat when he's going to have two tune-up games or whatever? But I think those are a lot of good names. That's kind of everybody I had on my radar, unless you guys have anybody else. That's it for me. Awesome. Well, Tyler, dude, absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, I think that we probably have covered everything necessary. I can't imagine that you have any parting thoughts, but super fun to get you in here and get your perspective on our contenders list and all of these other topics. Everybody go follow him. Hoop Venue on YouTube. Consistent, amazing video content. You guys will learn a lot about the game from watching Tyler. Follow him on Twitter, which is just Hoop Venue underscore. Or... Mm -hmm. Yep, Hoop Nailed Venue it. underscore. Nailed it first try. Follow him <laughs> on TikTok. I know you post clips from... Uh, your YouTube content. So obviously awesome guest to have on. We're going to have him on more super great historical knowledge as well. We may do a trivia showdown this summer. He's challenged me. I don't know why he would do it. Yeah. I don't know why he would do it to himself. A lot of people don't come back from that, bro. You can be the meek mill to my Drake if you want. Nah, nah. Tyler, <laughs> trust me. I'm, I'm a D, I'm, man. Tyler, <laughs> trust me. I'm, I'm 0 6 right now, bro. Uh, I have dug myself such a deep hole, dude. It's hard to come out. Nah, no, gonna... I'm locked in. I'll be, I'll be studying. <laughs> I'll be studying. Let's go. Let's go. He's gonna expose the fact that I'm hiding a child, and then I'm gonna have to release a song <laughs> about it. That's what's coming this summer. But would also just love to talk some more about all-time player rankings, which we did when we were talking about Jokic's peak when we had Tyler on a little over a month ago, I think it was, if you guys want to go back and watch that one. But anyways, shout out to you, man. Appreciate you coming on. All you guys, if you want more Nerd Sesh content, YouTube, we have all of our full shows. We're doing video essays, video breakdowns as well. I've got one coming tomorrow. Want to continue to do more of that throughout the playoffs. Follow us for our trivia content on TikTok. Uh, Instagram at nerd sesh, Twitter at nerd underscore sesh. You can check out our merch. Logan's got the hat on as always such a good company, man. That is at the volume.com. You can join our discord. If you want a chance to speak to the one and only Matthew spawn hour, he is there. That link is at the link tree across our social media bios. And with that, as always one last shout out to Tyler for coming on. I've been Carson Brabber. I've been Logan Camden. And this was nerd sesh. <laughs> <laughs>